Marhaba and welcome to Free Palestine Pod, the podcast. I'm Lama Bazzari. And I'm Lina Hadi. Each week, we will bring you in-depth commentary from Palestine. Let's talk Palestine. Today on the show, we welcome director and producer of Italian and Palestinian descent, Vena Fruso, whose debut film, Waldorf, is co-produced by Palestinian-American model and musician Anwar Hadid and a star-studded collaboration that includes Pink Floyd's Roger Waters. The documentary premiered in October to raving reviews and follows their journey through occupied Palestine as they explore the Waldorf Hotel in Bethlehem, owned by the iconic and and anonymous British artist Banksy. The film incorporates a timeline of the occupation through art and sheds the lens on the occupation. Marhaba Vin and welcome to Free Palestine Pod. Let's talk Palestine. Let's do it. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on your film. I haven't watched it personally, but I've heard incredible reviews on it and I've read a lot of it online. What inspired you to produce the film? I guess just being Palestinian growing up in in America, you know, it's one of those things where having the conversation isn't an easy thing to do because if you know about it, the time has changed a little bit. In, in, in the last couple of years, people have become more aware of what's going on and, and have a, a better idea of what the Palestinian cause actually is. But growing up for me in the, 10 years ago, it wasn't like that at all. So having a love for filmmaking. And I, I just knew that I wanted to incorporate that because it's a essentially an untold story and it's happening before our eyes and uh, we're directly connected to it. My peers are directly connected to it. If you pay taxes in America, you're directly connected to it. So being directly connected to it in that way and also being the grandson of Palestinian refugees, it was just something that, not not that just something I wanted to do, something I, I felt was necessary to do you know, becoming friends with Anwar and just everything just kind of just fell into place where it was like, this is what we have to do. Like now is the time, you know, and having the Waldorf hotel there was a really good intro into the minds of Americans because it's like, it's, it's not as easy to just get somebody involved or, or, or get them to try and get involved or care about a particular cause. You kind of have to bring them in with something entertaining, unfortunately. And and that was kind of the angle that I, I thought would be best to take. Then, you are still in screening mode and the film actually hasn't been released to the general public yet, as of yet. But we're not going to ask you the details, I'm not going to, about the film. But what I do want to know is, can you share with us some of the most challenging moments that you endured during the film and maybe some of the most powerful moments behind the camera? Especially with a film like this, Every moment is challenging, even up until now, you know, like we've had these really nice screenings and some really good write ups, but every day until it's 100% completed is a challenge starting from when we went, you know, like we landed and I brought a bunch of film equipment and as soon as we landed, we were told that the film equipment was going to be held withheld at the airport that, you know, they had to hold our bags. And I, the reason that they do this is so they could figure out where we're staying, right? You know, they say, oh, well, you know, your bags are going to be held for the next day or two. They're not in, sorry. Give us your address and and we'll have somebody from the airport bring it. But that's so that they can find out where you're staying in the West Bank, if you're staying in the West Bank. And uh, you need to give them an... It's actually, you can't give them an address in the West Bank. You have to give them an address in Israel. So that was a little bit of a challenge, working around that, making sure that we had an address in Israel to give them and then getting it. And we didn't get everything until, I think, six days in. And we were only there for 10 days. So majority of it, I actually had to shoot on the iPhone, which ended up working out great. Aside from that, weaving, like working in America, when you work on a film set or a documentary or a commercial shoot, everything's in line for you. Everything's set up. You could just kind of show up and do it. But going back and forth through the occupied territory from Bethlehem to Ramallah or going to Jerusalem, it's like, you know, you plan to shoot something at one hour. And then before you know it, of course, like you have to go through checkpoints. And for me as an American, like, you know, in my head, I'm complaining, but I'm like, this isn't even... I'm not a victim, you know, just because something that I wanted to shoot didn't go perfectly the way I wanted to it doesn't make me a victim. Like this is what people deal with every day to see sick family or just to, you know, literally anything you could think of of somebody's every single day, that's their every single day if you're a Palestinian in the West Bank, you know? 
powerful moments. I mean, just just being there the first time and the second time, which, you know, we went twice in 2019, uh, once in April, once in December. And the first time being there, it was just like, wow, I'm here. You know, it's, it's a place that I've spoken about or been spoken to about my entire life. And being there in person was just like surreal. And uh, as much as I thought I knew about Palestine or Palestinians or the the situation you just when you're there in real life like it becomes real and and you're no longer the expert like in America talking to my friends who are not Palestinian or don't know anything about Palestine I'm like the you know the Palestine expert and then I show up and I'm an American I'm not you know I'm not born here I'm not from here I, I can't really I can speak on behalf of the cause but I can't speak to the experiences so going there and actually witnessing the experiences and seeing people in in their everyday life was just like if I could have filmed everything and had the documentary be 10 hours long I would because there's so much that I want to say there's so much that I want to show and I think that one of the biggest challenges to go back to the challenges was being able to to take everything I shot and and, and put it into an hour and a half cuz like I said if if I could have free range it would be you know 20 hours long there's even until this day like there's things happening every single day that I'd love to include. There's going to be something that happens tomorrow that I'd love to include. So the real challenge I'd say after filming and everything else is being able to put it concisely within an hour and a half in a film for Americans to feel both entertained and informed, most importantly. Thank you. Uh, the film captures the, the faces, voices, and firsthand account of the Palestinian children that you met. Why was it important for you to turn the lens on these children and share their I've, stories. I think at the end of the day, it's the most important thing when, for me, at least when speaking about Palestine, because everybody can get into the politics of it and, you know, political parties and countries that support and how has it started. But it, when you just hear innocent kids speaking, it's hard to refute their claims where I'm at in the world. The conversation always gets distilled to Hamas or, you know, Israel's right to exist, whatever the case may be. And and that overshadows the voices, I, I believe, of kids like th that we spoke to. But when you hear them, it's really hard to just look at them, listen to them, hear them speak, speak in beautiful English, articulate, smart, great futures ahead. When you hear all of that, it's like, how do you just start saying, yeah, but Hamas, you know, like these kids are telling you what, the, how they want to live, how they want to live the way that we live in the same voice, in the same language. Hearing that, I feel like, and looking them like in their eyes as an American who doesn't support Palestine or, or, or anybody all over the world who doesn't really support the Palestinian cause and leans more towards the Israeli side. It's like, tell that to those kids. You can tell it to me when we're having a political debate, but when you hear you know, kids in school saying, well, this is what I want to be when I grow up. And unfortunately, these are the challenges that are set before me why I can't. It's I would challenge anybody to say, like, you don't want that for them. Well, this is what needs to happen in order for them to live that way. So that's why I felt like there's a lot of political content in it. But I think that the most powerful and impactful parts of the documentary, when you hear from children or, or, or you know, teens or young adults on the ground who are speaking in the same language as as us, just saying that we want, they want to have the same life as us, you know? So Vin, I want to talk to you about your reaching your ultimate goal with this film in execution. Do you feel like you've, you've actually reached the goal that you were trying to obtain when you went into this project? Yeah. It's funny because like, as you said, like it's, it's not even out yet. And I could already say that if it were to just get thrown in the trash tomorrow, I'd be happy. Not that I, I wanted to, but, you know, having Roger Waters on board, having, uh, we just attached a mortal technique who is a uh, huge influence on me. He's a, a genius art, a musical artist who put out some serious political records in, in the early 2000s and, and until this day and had a, a really, really serious influence on me. Kwaku Mandela came on board, enjoyed the project. He's in it. Uh, Anwar, you know, it's like these people are who I care. The, their perception of the film is who I care about. So if some Hollywood producer or director says, oh, well, I don't like his style or I didn't, that's fine. It's like, I already impressed. Like I would have been happy if Roger Waters just watched it, but he watched it, enjoyed it, called me and wanted to get involved so like right then and there it's like that's one of the ways of me reaching what i wanted to with this film and just even having people talk about it and you know oh, i can't wait to see it i've heard so many good things even that alone feel, feels great um i know that you know we're very very soon we're gonna announce a release date and i'm excited to see what happens but even up to this point it's been nothing but 
just like pure bliss to be able to even before people watched it know that it's about palestine and start talking about palestine that's my goal my entire goal with this is just bringing a voice to quote unquote the voiceless and you know they're not voiceless but it's just their voices are 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 muted here so even in discussing this film that nobody has seen it's helped get the word out about not just my film but more importantly about the palestinian cause uh, Vin, uh, we all have, I mean, every time we visit Palestine, especially as a Palestinian in the diaspora for the first time, it leaves an incredible impact on us personally. How was your first experience in 2019? If you could share with us. The first time we went, it was just like, so we landed and we had to go to Tel Aviv first. Then like, you know, just ignorant Americans were like, all right, we'll get an Uber. And we were staying in Jericho. So we get in a car and we give the guy the address. But before we had given him the address, we were driving a little bit and kind of uh, we had somebody who was translating. He only spoke Hebrew and nobody in the car spoke Hebrew. We had one person who spoke Arabic. So was, there was like a language barrier. But the guy had a nice attitude and he was happy and laughing with us. When he found out that we were going to Jericho, he said that's where the animals live. And then he ended up calling, I think, like the police and the woman's. He gave us the phone. The woman said that he's not allowed to drive there. And that's when we found out that, you know, Israeli citizens by law are not allowed to enter the West Bank because it's it's dangerous for them. And then obviously, you know, you know that that's not true. And there's countless Israeli human rights activists and, you know, ex-Israeli soldiers who have, quote unquote, come to the good side, who go into the occupied territories all the time. It's kind of it's like a law that's more just like it's frowned upon. You know, they don't they're not going to get arrested. But the majority of the Israeli public is under the assumption that it's illegal for them to go into the occupied West Bank. So once he realized where we were going, the his body language changed, tone of voice changed, and it took us a while to finally get there. And we had to get dropped off not far from the border and then have somebody from the other side come meet us. It, you know, it was a whole thing. And it was kind of just like, when I got into the car, I'm like, wow, this is great. You know, we're here. We're going to get driven right there. And then within seconds, I was like, okay, here, you know, this is this is what I know to be true. These are the issues. It's like, you know, you're in a country that's smaller than New Jersey. We were really, in essence, 20 minutes away, and it took two hours to just to get us into this little place because of, you know, these laws and these all this stuff. And I'm just like thinking to myself, this is it. This is what I've been trying to tell people. But once we got inside into the West Bank and I was in Jericho, just looking around and seeing all the signs in Arabic and seeing the flag and, you know, pictures of Yasser Arafat, he's gone however many years, just it brought me back to everything. It was like the real life, you know, like, you, it was like, you hear about a story, and then of a place, and then you get there, there's a difference, like you have, you know, when you, you know, when you read a book, and then they make a movie about that book, and you're like, oh, well, I saw this differently, or I, oh, I saw this part, that's what it was like, and I, but at the end of the day, I was just in awe, like, just be just when, I, when we first pulled into Palestine, just seeing the flag, I'm like, I'm here. I'm in, I'm in Palestine. Like this is it. And I'm the I'm the first one from my family to ever go back. My grandparents left in '48 and went to Lebanon. My mom was born in Lebanon, but I'm the first of my entire family to go back to Palestine. So it was just like there was so many emotions, such as like a surreal moment, and just like I said, like looking around, I I couldn't figure out what to think. But as every day went on, I we found the local restaurant we go to all the time and you know these this group of people that we hung out all the time. so every single day like you learn more you see more and and by the end of it, before I left I was just like I want to come here once a month if I can but it's not as easy you know so Vin circling back to 1948 when your grandparents were violently forced out of Palestine and into Lebanon. They, they fled to Lebanon and going perhaps not that far back but to your own childhood and your amazing mother, Regina, and your wonderful uncles and your cousins. Tell us about your childhood and tell us when did you realize that you were an activist? Am I an activist? I don't I don't really know that I am. Uh, I guess I am. I mean, I just like, I don't really, um, it's hard to do the whole label thing for me because if I'm categorized as an activist, I, I would say that I do forms of activism, but there's also other things I do where somebody could be like, He's not an activist, you know, but I, okay, so. I would definitely, many artists, there is activism art. I would call this type of mm. a film activism art. It's an activism. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Exactly, in that way. So um, no, not that you're rallying. In <laughs> but we do know who your BFFs are. I would say as early as like third grade, you know, I have older cousins who are pro-Palestinian 
uh, that I looked up to a lot. You know, listen, my grandmother, you know what it's like growing up in a Palestinian family. It's almost impossible to not know about her, to not care. So I was both taught and also just having the, the, the knowledge put before me. It's like, how do you not? I don't understand how people could be taught about something like this and then not go in the, the lane of, of activism for the Palestinians or at least speaking about it. You know, like I said, like my grandmother, it's like she's watching the news all the time. You're talking about it. anything that happened over there. And plus, you know, I, I grew up I was in third grade when when 9-11 happened and people don't remember. But like the first two hours of while that was happening, the Palestinians were mentioned how many times, you know, like if you go back Howard Stern's um, live broadcast of 9-11, he was that when they didn't know who it was, they just kept saying Arafat and the PLO and Israel's got to let loose. And then even after they found out it was Osama bin Laden or whatever. One of the main narratives was that the reason that it happened was because of the United States and the United States' support for Israel. And so this was, this isn't mentioned that much anymore, but for the first couple months, like this was the justification as to why 9-11 happened was America supports Israel. So the Palestinians get lumped into that conversation immediately. And, and people forget a couple of days after 9-11, I, th I think it was literally like a couple of days, Israel bombed the airport in Gaza and destroy the airport in Gaza because, and the justification was that, well, you saw what happened in America. They could fly planes from Gaza right into Tel Aviv. And it was as simple as that. Nobody questioned it. And, you know, this was an airport that was their economy, you know, that, that crushed their economy. So just having some knowledge of any of this, it was like, I had no choice. It surrounded me, you know, my family's Palestinian. This is what's being spoken about in the news. We're literally lumped into one of the greatest tragedies that's ever happened on American soil. So it was like, it was inevitable. There was, there was no, I didn't really have a choice. Like, Waldorf uh, artistically captures the Western media narrative regarding Palestine and depicts the absurdity of the occupation. What is the message that you wish resonates with the audience as they watch it? So there's a few messages. I would say that overall, though, it's that Western media pretty much up until right now. I mean, it started to change a little bit, especially with Shireen. Like, you know, there was some there was some honest reporting and there was just images that you couldn't dispute with regards to her funeral that people started to really see. But up until that, and even like I said, right now, I would say that probably the main message is that everything, if you're from the West, 95% of the things that you've heard about Palestine are just simply not true or they're distorted to be looked through in a, in a lens that is just to support military support for Israel from the United States. Because, you know, at the end of the day, the Western media, Western politicians, they make it about anti-Semitism and supporting the Jewish state. But they, you know, that's that's not why they do it. There's, you know, weapons contracts that are involved and land expansion and, and military outposts. And these are the real issues. If they were if they were able to just come out and say it like that, this is what it is. I wouldn't have a film to make, but because they have to create this narrative to get people behind it because nobody would actually support that it's the same thing with like the war in iraq right if they, if they were just going to say no we're going to start this war that'll cost us a couple trillion dollars we'll be there for 20 years a lot of people will die american public opinion would say well why would you do that so instead it's you know saddam hussein has weapons of mass destruction america you know remember 9 11 this could happen to you and you know that's why we're going to go to war that's why you should sign the patriot act where we could tap everybody's phones because it's to protect you. So there's these narratives that have to be created in order to get the public behind it. And for that reason, I was able to make a film because there's media agenda, which is always government agenda. They're, they're really inter interlocked. Doesn't matter if they're talking against the current party or whatever. There's a narrative that coincides both politics and the media. It's, you know, they, they walk within the same steps. And because of that, and me being Palestinian and going there, I have loads of footage of the news and politicians saying something and then me cutting and showing you a completely different thing. And I think it just speaks to anybody who, who's able to have a conversation or has had a conversation about Palestine and Israel. It's like, well, just check this out. Before you have that conversation, just look at that. And what I did was like, it, it's kind of cut and, and shot in an unconventional style of like a lot of archive footage where it just kind of cuts back and forth and juxtaposition. And it's almost as if like, I'm not saying anything. I'm just showing you what has been said and what exists. And you can make your own, you can make your mind up after that on how you feel about it. If you want to dispute the claims that I put in there, that's fine. But I'm, I'm showing you what it is. I'm showing you what's been said actually from 48 up until today and what's happened, documented thing, you know, so here's what's been said in the West and here's what's happened. You know, from there, you can 
you can make your own judgment on that. So then now that you've produced and directed this film and hopefully soon it's going to be out for distribution, what do you have planned next? I have a couple things in my back pocket, as they say, but I think that, and you actually haven't seen this yet, since the screening in New York, what I've done from there is uh, we had to do an original score. So like I had a lot of this, I had a lot of great music in the documentary, but at the end of the day, you know, I can't sell the documentary until that music is licensed. I was able to license some of it, but not all of it. So I had to do an original score and in doing the original score, I was able to rework the ending a little bit where I, I tease what's potentially coming next. So. Okay, great. Well, I mean, Con it's conversations with... that we've had you and I, but I think that, you know, to give you a concrete answer, I mean, who knows? It's like, you know, there, there's a lot of things I want to do in my career that aren't only like Palestine in the lane of Palestine or in the lane of politics. But at the end of the day, there will always be something that I do. So whether it's a film or utilizing today's methods of watching content, YouTube, little, you know, five minute short documentaries, interviews with people. I, I think that after this film comes out, we're, you know, me and the people that I work with will be able to create something a little bit more concrete and consistent to ensure that this message doesn't go away. It wasn't just, you know, it's not a one off thing that I did because it was, you know, it's, it's a passion project. It's a passion project, but it's a passion project until the end goal is released. So I wouldn't be able to stop in a way. How have you dealt with any Israeli uh, backlash against the film and I'm sure you'll receive a lot more of that once it officially is released. I got a lot of backlash from posting some things on, on social media and then you know it being shared and going viral and my DMs were flooded with death threats and whatever else it's just like I either don't answer or turn it into something funny. You can't take it seriously and taking it seriously I think is exactly what they want Right. And when I say they, I don't specifically mean the Israelis. I don't mean Jewish people. I, I mean, whoever is, uh, you know, in control. Wars and conflicts don't happen on accident. Uh, that's my belief. I think that they're, you know, it's a money machine. So whoever's in, in control of that money machine, which looks to be the United States, you're going you're going to get backlash. So to feed into it and to kind of feed into this divide and conquer strategy that's been put before us, it's a waste of time. But I I have I have challenge people who have challenged me on some of the quote things I've put out I've challenged them right back say all right well you want to have a conversation about it let's let's do a podcast about it and then you know nobody will answer because they just want to make it where it's like oh he's anti-semitic or oh he's uninformed and I'm when, when you bring that conversation to the table like okay I'm uninformed let's have a conversation about it and we'll see you know we'll see what's going on and nothing much has, has really happened and I, I'm willing to have a conversation with anybody you know literally anybody about the film about my beliefs on the quote unquote conflict. But I think taking the backlash seriously, it hurts a lot of people. I post a lot of content that's rooted in, in comedy. And I think taking that approach really works in today's day and age because it shows a level of confidence and understanding that you're putting it, you're putting your foot down. Like I can't be screwed with. I'm not even taking your backlash seriously. I don't take you seriously. So to take the backlash seriously, but more importantly, take the people seriously who are who are trying to give you backlash. It's like now they won. So without you know without taking them seriously, they lose. Like if somebody comes to you in a very serious approach and and you just make a complete joke out of them with you know proving yourself right, they have nothing. You know. But in in terms of when the film comes out. It's a matter of who's challenging it, right? Who's going to challenge it? What are they going to pick apart? There's a lot of decisions in the film that I'm prepared to talk about. Because I know that there's going to be things that are brought up like, oh, you know, you didn't bring up, you didn't touch upon not once in the hour and a half. I could hear somebody already saying not once in that hour and a half did he really go into the whole Hamas thing. And it's like, all right, well, let's have that conversation. You know, I didn't, it's not about that. It's about the, Hamas came around in what, the 80s? It's like, this has been happening since 1948. The clock doesn't have to start when, other people want it to start it's like let's start it when it actually started and then anything else after that doesn't it doesn't even really make sense in the conversation and that's one of the biggest i think mistakes that a lot of people who support the palestinian cause make they jump right into conversations to debate things that are you know a week old and it's like well this is 70 plus years old it's like you have to start there in order to have a real conversation because nothing else matters that guy punched me in the face. And if you just start there, it's like, well, let's go back a little bit. Turns out you have been kicking him for 70 years. 70 years later, he punched you in the face. It's like, let's go into everything beforehand. That's a great analogy. 
One thing that I, I think definitely Lema, Lema and myself and, and, and the community feel that you are definitely, any project that you work on in the future, you will be an impact to the Palestinian society because you are after all Palestinian. You're a Palestinian film producer and director and we are all extremely proud of you. Although Lema hasn't seen the film and she'll see it soon, I think there have been so many people that have seen it to date all from various professions and quite some interesting names and I've seen nothing but very positive reviews. So we're all, I'm so looking forward to you getting it out to the general population so that everyone can appreciate and understand your work. And we are so thankful for film producers like you, because without you, we're not going to get the word out about Palestine. So thank you. And thank we you. really look forward to it. Let us help you in any way you can. Lama and I are here for you. We have communities around us and everyone is so excited to see your product. So your film. So no, everyone look forward to the wall dog. Definitely. Go and ahead. and uh, I know I, I appreciate it. And of course I will, you know, everybody, we're all kind of in this together in a way, you know, it's like, sure, it's my film, but it takes an army of people to get something, whether it's a film, whether it's an idea for a business, it's like, you know, nothing just happens with one person and it, ta it takes a community. So I, I definitely appreciate that. And, um, you know, you know, Lena and I have had this conversation a million times. It's time. I'm officially like, I could say that I'm, you know, the narrative is there. I'm just now I'm working the, uh, the technical little things to before putting it out but you know because i have this problem where i keep updating it you know there's before anytime i show it something that is either um a week before a day before is is in it either a title card or something so that it just stays as up to date and relevant but now i feel that from when i started it to when i finally was able to stop editing it's come full circle to where i needed it to because like i said if not i would i could update it every single day i could literally you know there's it could it could never stop yeah i th i think that very very soon we're going to announce a release date a teaser and then an official trailer and um be able to have people watch it and there's a few different distribution methods that we're we're currently talking about but all of them at the end of the day are are very um they're going to work out for all of us, if that makes sense. What about Netflix? They seem to be on the, no? They, I, I, feel, I don't know. Netflix does a little dance back and forth. I don't know. I don't, you know, who knows? You know, them taking that new film and, you know, the first title card opening up and you see land and it says Palestine 1948. That was like a shock to me. That was the first, I was, I could not believe my eyes that I'm sitting watching tv on this giant conglomerate of a platform and it says palestine 1948 it was like to me that was like the world has changed the world changed already that's a sign of like a serious revolution like cinematic revolution cultural revolution that was a disputed claim for how many years right that palestine not, wasn't even i'm not sure it was disputed i think they just buried it I think yeah. they successfully well, buried it. When, when I say America. disputed, when I say disputed, people are under the assumption that it's disputed. It's like, well, you know, that's they that, well, what do you mean? Know. They fought the other narrative because that's what they were presented with, you know? Mm. That's why films like yours, The Walled Off, are so important. And it's very important, all these films. But, the, you know, we need to start getting information. We've got 105 years of Zionist propaganda that we need to now counter. And it's films like yours and films like Darin's that are going to make the difference, you know? So well, that's the thing. And like, that's actually the biggest challenge, right? It's like being a filmmaker, making a film about Palestine. It's one of the most dangerous things to the other side's propaganda, right? Because like the real war that Israel has been winning is a PR war. Mm -hmm. So essentially this is like in ways is a bigger threat, right? Because they've thrived off of support from the West of the narrative being in their favor. Right. You know, Hamas, OK, Hamas is a, a threat to the state of Israel, but it's like what's really a threat? It's, it's public opinion of the country that is their biggest financial supporter. If, if public opinion fully shifts, that's a real issue. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Lama? Thank you, Vin, for being with us. Very inspiring. And we can't wait for the official release. Is there any screenings uh, coming up in the pipeline? Yeah. So we're coming to London. There's one that's planned on the 20th. It's a private one. And then at some point, not long after, looking to go to the Middle East. But I think before the 20th of London, I want to do, I was talking to Lena, I'd like to do a little bit of like a European tour of a couple of screenings, mm -hmm. either right after or right before the release. So, you know, we're looking at the screenings in mid, late January. So maybe, maybe a, a real release 
prior to or right after. But I think that this week and right after the holidays, I'm going to explore all options of screenings in, in Europe and, and the Middle East uh, in the month of January. So stay tuned. Great. Well, we're excited. And and uh, as I told you, you know, Lama is there for you in Dubai. So yes. Yeah, let's, let's definitely talk. Is there anything else that you were just wondering either about the film or, or anything else from your end? No, we look forward to having a screening in Dubai. I mean, there's been a lot of people asking about an official release and being able to uh, watch it. A lot of people have been, it's been, you know, people have been buzzing about it since its premiere in Italy. Yeah, we have to categorize those as screenings because the version I was showing was like a, you know, a version with copyrighted music and I couldn't charge tickets. It was just, you know, screenings and then from there being able to push it forward. But now that the original score is done, we're going to push the screenings further, which can actually kind of be considered as premieres. But yeah, we did, we did one in Italy and gave it a little time and then like a bigger one in October just to kind of light the flame and, and have people getting ready to start talking about it, which is, and it's it's been great from that point on. So now that that's all happened, you have to kind of strike while the iron's hot. So we're getting ready very, very soon. We look forward to it. Thank you very much for joining us today, Vin. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this week on Free Palestine Pod. Subscribe, like, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And be sure to come back next week for a new episode of Free Palestine Pod. Let's talk Palestine.